So yeah, that's my pleasure now to uh, introduce Michel. We're gonna talk about the parcellation of white matter based on um, functional MRI. Uh, yeah, so that's gonna be, uh, I'm sure, a really great uh, presentation because Michel has a very long expertise uh, in the field. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so now we've seen how to divide the white, mat the white matter anatomically and divide the cortex based on the structural connectivity. And in a recent work, we, uh, we published these maps where we divide the white matter uh, based on uh, task-related functional activation that happen in the cortex that we decode with the white matter. And, and for this educational law, so that walks you through how to do this kind of uh, decoding so that you can run it yourself on, on your own time, uh, if you like. Um, so this is white matter, uh, but most of us are more uh, familiar with uh, this kind of representation of the brain that are just simple axial slices of the brain where you can uh, easily spot uh, the difference between the gray matter and the white matter, the gray matter being gray and the white matter being white. But the white matter is not like this simple structure that is of blunt organization. It is actually way more complex than that. It is made of uh, wires that uh, connect at very high speed around 300 to 350 kilometer per hour, uh, different areas in the brain. I often do this uh, metaphor when I'm in the train between Paris to Bordeaux, or any kind of high-speed train, uh, you reach at those kind of speed. And this is probably how an action potential feel when you like uh, onto an axon, you go at that speed between uh, different brain areas. In this slide, so you look at the structure of white matters have been cut into slabs. Uh, um, if I get a mic, I can walk you through it. Um, you can Hello? Okay. You can see that the white matter is organized in different structures. You have main connections that you see like here in red and change their color because here it's coded according to the orientation of the white matter. So structure here in the middle are connecting the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere, and very essential for the integration of the functioning between the hemispheres. Um, but you see also like some of those blue structure over here that are cut and uh, those are the projection system, and they're mostly corresponding to subcortical nuclei projecting on the surface of the brain, as well as a spinal cord uh, that, that project uh, to the surface of the brain, and also the cerebellar projections. And you have also those structures that are in green, that are high-speed connections between regions within the same hemisphere, and, and they make like quick associations between regions that are far apart in the brain. And when I started studying white matter, I was uh, always wondering, what do you need to draw wires that long between brain regions and not put them next to each other if that's not because there is something critical happening that requires the association, the fast association between those brain areas? Um, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to tell you is that connections in the brain are critical for the functioning of the brain, even way more than just conducting the signal from A to B. Actually, function might eventually emerge just from this interaction rather than just a conduction. Um, if you're interested in uh, connections and uh, roles and meanings and method and how to study it, um, I've been reading a few books about it. Um, and um, I thought, like, because this is an educational and we're always looking for good reading for the summer, I'll uh, walk you through why I like those books. And um, so you know, you know, if you're interested in one domain, into stru studying structural connectivity, which books you should buy and read. Uh, this summer. Um, I'll start with uh, my book with Marco Ketani that I obviously liked because, you know, I wrote it. But 
This is a book that will uh, tell you about the anatomy of white matter connection and the history of white matter connections, as well as divide those connections into different systems and their functional role based on what we knew before 2010. Um, then there is this pair of books from Olaf Spawns. Um, in the network of the brain, you'll have a depiction of all the methods that can be used to study connection in the brain microscopically, as well as a very, very nice introduction about the history of studying connections. In his other book, which is Discovering the Human Connectome, you have an explanation how to use graph theory and what graph theory really mean in the studying of, of connections. Uh, we heard a little bit about graph theory this morning, but it is an interesting way to study connection because it can capture the structure of the connectivity and help you identify modules in the brain and association in a way that is different than uh, just looking at the anatomy of the brain. In some, um, uh, if, you, if you look at the graph theory, you get rid of the neuroanatomy and instead of having things that are far apart but highly connected in the brain, you'll bring them closer when they are uh, technically uh, highly connected. So you get rid of anatomy and you look at it from a different perspective, which is connections and eventually timing, because connection is decreasing the timing of, of synchronization. I read this book, which is called uh, Cerebral Cortex, that might be misleading because it's like, wait, well, we're talking about white matter, it's called Cerebral Cortex, but it is actually a wonderful book that brings together architecture, connections, and a model of brain evolution, which is called the dual origin concept. It is uh, really probably the most advanced anatomical descriptions of connections in the brain and main rules of the relationship between the situ architecture of the brain, the way the cell are organized within the sixth layer of the cortex, and as a connection between brain regions. And it also gives you a nice model to think about to do comparative anatomy between uh, rodents, uh, um, non-human primates, and, and humans. You have the fiber pathway of the brain. Uh, it's also a wonderful book. It's dedicated to the axonal tracing in uh, the macaque brain. Uh, so you'll have all the details of 20 to 50 years of axonal tracing in the macaque brain condensed together into this book with a wonderful text describing the anatomy and the behavior of a macaque. The book of Sebastian Seung, I Am My Connectome, How the Brain's Wiring Makes Us Who We Are, is a more conceptual book. He's been doing a lot of electron microscopy, and his uh, goal in life was to reconstruct a mice connectome, um, which he didn't achieve because now he moved on to the private industry. But the book is interesting in the concept that is behind it, which is you not really your cortical activations, you really the way your brain is connected. And the way you experience life or you learn new things will be a different way you weight those connections between neurons. Um, Fundamental of the Brain Networks Analysis, it is really a book that will explain to you step by step how to do graph theory with support of software. So if you want to uh, throw yourself into graph theory, read the book, do it step by step. At the end of the book, you're a professional, you know how to do graph theory. That's the basically, this is, this is it. they did the job, it's a great, great, great book. And then you have the Entangled Brain from Luis Pessoa that is coming out and uh, next November uh, 2022. That is also a really good book where he's talking about this entanglement in the brain where function might not emerge from the single activity of a brain area, but through the interaction between brain areas and function being the emergence of this interaction. So um, if you read all this, you can come here and give my talk. That's what I'm saying. Um, now, all right, so, so this is how to study connections or why connections are so important. Well, you don't have to believe me, but you certainly should believe these people. Um, so David Venison, in 
1982, I, I remember well, 1983, sorry, said that ARIA can be arranged in a well-defined hierarchy on the basis of the pattern of interconnections. It really means that the connections are driving the organization of the brain. Um, as a matter of fact, he drawn those beautiful circuits here where regions are arranged based on the connections. If you're more a master mesulum person, you will read that he said that nothing defines the function of a neuron more than its connections with other neurons. And, well, you cannot be more extreme than this. Essentially, he's saying that really the way you are connected they're going to define what you're going to do. Um, and then a few more Carl Zillis person, uh, maybe you know, a little wiser, you read that he said afferent afferent an intrinsic connection as well as cellular type and their properties are the structural basis of a brain region's function. In sum, we spend so much time studying the cortex, why it really looks like the solution is in the connections. And mostly we've been doing that because for a very long time we didn't have any way to study those connections until in humans, in the living human brain, until we had diffusion weighted imaging. Yet, nowadays, all our atlases, even the best one published in, published in Nature, um, such as the one of Matt Glasser in 2016, who, who will have the presentation this afternoon, give great precision and sharp information about the division of the cortex, that they will flatten, but nothing about the white matter division in terms of function or functional territories. So we thought, how about we try to solve this? And we brought our best tools to try to solve this. Um, we thought, like, if we want to divide the white matter basin function, we need the largest data set that give us information about how function distribute in the cortex. Um, so we took Neurosynth. We went onto the website, hacked the website, downloaded all the maps. Then we thought like we can get to use the best tractography that we can have to get the anatomy of how things are connected together. Um, so for that, we downloaded the uh, Human Connectome Project at 7 Tesla from uh, uh, the diffusion weight imaging from the Human Connectome Project. It's 180 subjects. It's free of access. You can have it. And we process it with our, our best tool, which is a star track. So we spend decades adjusting our code to have a tractography that match post-mortem dissections. I don't want to fight with anybody about what is the best tractography, but our belief is it should match post-mortem dissections. And that's, that's just where I'm going to leave it. And there are like other people who prefer to use tractography to extract as much information as you can from it, from a computational perspective. But this is not what we do, and this is not the school where we're coming from. We're anatomists, so that's what we use. And we created matrices of how things are connected using the parcellation of Matt Glasser, which is uh, a very interesting one and sometimes um, uh, underestimated. So if you open the supplementary material of this paper, it's about 150 pages of analysis and demonstration and supplementary material. Um, each parcel is described and linked up with the literature. So we spend a lot of time on that. And it's really worth uh, reading the supplementary material of this paper. All this is freely available, so you can, you know, you can do it at home or over the summer if you like. And uh, all the links are also available in the program of OHBM, as well as for all the presentation this morning. All right, how do we do that? Um, so we thought, what about if we were seeding randomly the brain thousands of times um, in all the subjects? 
to produce for each seed a probability map of connections. Simple. Well, you can do that. We have a software that does it for you. Uh, we usually use it for brain lesions, but here, let's imagine we have uh, random seeds. Or should we? Because if we think about it, where are those functions coming from? Uh, you know, how did we define function? How did we think about episodic memory being different from semantic memory? Um, I think it's fundamentally coming from the fact that we met patients who had a brain lesion and had a problem, and we were like, whoa, what is going on? And then we thought maybe he has a problem remembering about his past, episodic memory, or he specifically has a problem into remembering uh, what an object is, and that would be more semantic memory. So there might be a bias in the way we understand function, which is linked to as a distribution of lesion in the brain. And so we added this level of questioning, which is, are we going to have a better decoding of function using random seeds or using lesions that you have in the most uh, frequent time, which is uh, uh, stroke? Um, if you take stroke, the distribution of stroke is highly biased. There are areas that are more often damaged and other and must have bias the way we define functions. And in order to control well, we created a random distribution of lesions. The code is also available with the paper uh, uh, of, of regions that are exactly the same size as a lesion, randomly distributed, uh, but respecting the distribution between left and right hemisphere as well. So it is matched in every way except that it is randomly distributed and that's where you see that there is no red here, it's because it is randomly distributed. And for each of those regions, we convert them into map of uh, connections, probability of connections or disconnections in the case of lesions. So we then further characterize as a matrix using the Maglasa parcellation plus subcortical areas extracted from the AL3 uh, uh, atlas. Because if there is something missing in that parcellation, it's subcortical structures. And subcortical structures are really important. So don't forget to use subcortical structures. Um, the lesions were provided by Parash Kefnachev. That's why his picture is on this slide. It was just an acknowledgement. So thank you, Parash Kef. All right. And then those matrices of uh, deconnection, we... Uh, oh, that's funny. Why is it upside down? <laughs> it's a conversion between Mac and, um, and PC. Anyway, don't pay attention to that. Not yet. Uh, so you take the components of your matrix of uh, connections for all your seeds, and you put it in a principal component analysis with a Varimax rotation, and you, you try to see how much variance you can explain with that. Um, if you take the random seed, with one component, you explain not that much variance. With two components, you explain a little more. And you carry on like this until you reach a new cap about 85% of the variance of your connectivity being explained by the principal component analysis with about 30 components. I think to reach 100, you need uh, um, to reach 100 uh, percent, you need like 70 or 80 components. With stroke lesion pattern of connections. If you run your principal uh, component analysis, you'll see that you always explain more variants. It's because they're not randomly distributed, so it's easier to simplify. And you reach a cap uh, of 99.5% of the variance being explained with 43 components. And that's great, because you really simplified your problem in from an infinite number of dimensions to 43 which is it's great news. 
And then what we did, we were like, okay, those components are profile or disconnection, ingredients of, of, of disconnections that repeat themselves. Uh, we're going to see whether we can correlate that with pattern of activations in the brain, meta-analytic activation from neuroscience. And so I do apologize if that's upside down. You have the activation pattern over here, and you have the log score of uh, the structural connectivity uh, in the X axis, and you have this systematic correlation between each of the component and a specific uh, cognitive domain of activation. And so I was like, wow, this is cool. Is it better or worse if I use random seeds? Remember the question, are we biased by uh, lesions? And so we compared, and you can see that actually, when you use lesion in the brain, you will decode better functions than if you use random seeds. And the main reason is the way we conceive function has been highly biased by the distribution of lesions. And this little difference that we have here is, is this bias that exists. So we took in our advantage to build our atlas of function of the white matter, but ultimately, we should fill that gap. So those were numbers, but uh, you know, I kind of like to see some brain. Um, so what we did, we did a regression of the loadings of each components onto uh, uh, each of the map of connections to create statistical map of the connections that were related to uh, uh, each of the components. And we did it twice to assess replicability of the findings. So when you do that, the maps that you have have a correlation of 0 0.8, which is, which is solid replicability. Um, so you remember I showed you like you know the slide with the text that was upside down. So I showed you correlation with functions. Those are the same example of functions and components that I used here. Um, so the component number one correlated very well with activation in the article that involved articulatory uh, functions. And when we look at the white matter that was related to this component number one is, is mostly the arcade fasciculus plus U-shaped fibers connecting the insula. Um, no surprise here in the left hemisphere. This is a track that we talk a lot about with language uh, in healthy controls, changing with language, but also in patients when it is disconnected, uh, leading to aphasias. The component number six, was related a lot to navigation. And uh, what we had essentially are connections between the V2 area and the retrosplenial cortex and the pi hippocampus cortex and, uh, and the hippocampus, of course. Um, this is a system, as you know, in the hippocampus, uh, you have the spatiotopic maps. Connecting it with the visual cortex is probably a good idea in order to uh, orient yourself and navigate in space. Uh, so again, here we thought like it was a good uh, candidate of connection supporting through this integration as a function. For activation related to the eye field, so we didn't find any connection with the parietal eye field, but we find this strong interhemispheric connection between uh, the left and the right uh, frontal eye field. I want to stress that the uh, level of significance of those map are thresholded extremely high. So we like around uh, T value of uh, 10 over here and 30 over there. So like there are also extra connection contributing to that. I'm just showing you as uh, the top uh, contributing connections. Uh, but the association between the right and the left front eye I feel is essential for um, uh, the coordination of the gaze. And uh, as a matter of fact, if you have a patient that show a stroke damaging uh, the front eye eye field, it's not only one eye that's going to deviate, those are the two eyes. And that shows a level of interaction between that you have between these regions. Um, another example is uh, component 12 uh, for calculation. And you'll be like, it's funny because these look really very much into the gray matter 
of the intraparietal sulcus. That's because our eyes are biased to the gray matter. This is truly in the white matter. So those are all the U-shaped fibers that connect uh, the intraparietal sulcus, the top and the inferior part of the intraparietal sulcus. And um, in terms of uh, acalculia, you got this uh, paper of Andreas Kleinschmidt, who um, described that the Gassman syndrome that include acalculia is associated to the deconnection of the U-shaped fibers of the intraparietal sulcus. So in a nutshell, those components are correlated with functions, and when you look at their anatomy in terms of connections, they seem to have a link as well with symptoms or what we know about what those connections should do and what kind of symptom you should see when they are deconnected. But this is only 46 uh, components that we talked about, and I show you only four, but there are way more functions than that. And we thought maybe those components, like the example of the soup that I took this morning, are just the ingredient of main functions that combine together to give you those extra functions uh, that need the interaction between these components. So we flipped a little bit our uh, uh, matrix of analysis and we looked at for each of the task related meta-analytic activation, the profile of correlation with the components that we use as a regressor to produce map for each of the neuroscient uh, cortical map inside the white matter. So we did twice to check again if that was replicable or we just modeling noise. And here we had a correlation of 0 0.88 between uh, the two data sets. And this is how we ended up in this, because we had 502, if I remember well, map of white matter related to specific terms. So I'll spare your time and not show, will not show you those 502 maps. We summarize here into this top contribution map that you see here. Uh, but each individual map is downloadable from NeuroVault. And you find like this contribution, for example, of the Parisilvian white matter to language, to pseudo word, phonological fluency, and the contribution of the same a uh, Parisilvian white matter in the right hemisphere being more related to impulsivity. Um, in the core of the brain, uh, where you're going to have the phonics over there, you have maintaining and binding information together through association. Um, you can really have fun and get lost into these maps. But we were like, this is the top of the iceberg. It might not be uh, uh, really fair to just give to people an atlas, which is one dimension, and where we show that there is only one function per track, which is absolutely not true. You have many functions involving those tracks. Um, first, we assess the effect size of those prediction inside the white matter. Uh, that we use an, uh, as an R, which is like um, uh, the goodness of fit between our model and the prediction. And here you can see like the entire brain is uh, of uh, uh, high effect size, uh, but except for some structures that are like here, like in a portion of the corpus callosum, and a little bit in the uh, cerebellum of that, yeah, also the points that it was not very well uh, predicted. And then we put this cap at a middle effect size, 0 0.5, and we try to see how many terms are loading on each white matter streamlines to give us uh, what we call versatility maps, which are like how many functions can be associated to uh, the white matter for each of the streamlines. And, uh, and you can see here that you have a strong asymmetry uh, in favor to the left hemisphere, mostly the language system, where you see that you have so many more term and functions that have been studied and accumulated for the left hemisphere of the arcuate fasciculus compared, compared to the right hemisphere. Here is the top 
part of the arcade fasciculus, you can get up to 70 terms. While in the right hemisphere, you're happy if you have uh, three or four. And that's, that's mainly because we know so much more about language than we know about visuospatial processing, impulsivity, and emotion. We have such a sharp division and granularity of the different level of language that we have, and we have no equivalent for the right hemisphere. And that requires also more work. That's it, you have here the list of uh, all the uh, uh, data and results that you can download for free, so all the softwares and the code that allow you to calculate the effect size maps, as well as the code that allow you to create random uh, parcellations that are matched with any parcellation that you want uh, in terms of uh, size of parcels. And, uh, and distribution. I want to thank these people that have always been super helpful uh, working with me. And I uh, just want to remind you that we have this special issue in brain structure and function that Sarah and I are uh, gonna handle all year um, where you can submit any new parcellation, any new idea of parcellation or update on a current parcellation that you, know, you just saw that was published a few years ago, maybe it needs a little update will be happy to receive that as well. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Michel, for the very educational uh, presentation. I think we can feel the professor inside you. That, that, that's great in this uh, very long uh, uh, experience of reading a lot of books. I really like this, this, this view of really going deep into, into one topic. Uh, by reading a lot and going uh, yeah, into the literature. Okay, uh, we have time for questions. So, um, yes, there is one uh, over there. <laughs> Hi, that was fascinating. My question is, um, when you, um, what is the next frontier, right? Uh, do you think seven Tesla magnet, high resolution connectome scanners could explain some, for example, the pawns, right? I was thinking. Uh, Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think like the, well, the next frontier is into identifying the missing function, having a framework that put all the function together and tells you why when you're missing something will be already a way to uh, to see better. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that, already, that would already be really good. Then seeing directly the activation of the white matter will be also another big challenge because here we decoding the activation in the cortex through the profile of connectivity uh, that those regions have, but we don't directly measure the activity in the white matter. Um, and that is, uh, that is unfortunately missing uh, for technical reasons. That's too, too, too good challenges. Ah, another question, yeah. Um, just when you mentioned con uh, activation from the white matter, how about um, connectivity from the gray matter or vice versa as to bold fluctuations from the white matter? So it's interesting you're asking that. Um, so I tried it on my side. I tried to see like uh, 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 fluctuation in the white matter. And, uh, and I'm silly, I really tried areas that I know the connectivity, but very likely to be contaminated by neighboring areas and give you something completely different. And I was a bit disappointed by the results, but I know that other people, you know, they advance the methods and made progresses, so I look forward to uh, see convincing, very convincing results. Other questions? Okay. Uh. Yeah, uh, it's a clinical question. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering in the, the example of stroke, so if some part of the brain is damaged, basically probably cortex is switched off somehow, or maybe it's not switched off, it's partly damaged or it's still working, 
the speed of the axon that you just uh, gave us like 300 kilometers per hour, like the speed of yeah. the, yeah. 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 Um, do you think that speed may change if you have a lesion in your brain or completely be disconnected? I, is it somehow you can visualize or quantify that the, uh, the co the connect the connection is weakened but is not yet dead that's something that would be clinically relevant for this kind of so um so it depends depends the level of damage that you're thinking about so if that's uh, an inflammation you know the connection can get compressed and like the condition might be slowed down or interrupted by temp but temporarily um but if that's a brain disconnection, the only way you can recover the function is through taking another path that didn't used to be the path that you were taking to do that function. Um, and it's like in life, if the main road to go from point A to point B is upstream, like you cannot take it and you take another, wa another way to go, it's going to take more time. And, and you eventually also have associated uh, 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 other functions that will be activated through the way, uh, which are like those uh, parasitic behavior. I'm thinking, you know, for example, extinction in visual neglect. I don't know if you know visual neglect. Not gonna go in visual neglect today. This is not, <laughs> not gonna start and give you another half hour of this. But <laughs> but they they lose, you know, the, the awareness on one side. Uh, and they do recover eventually, uh, but when you stimulate both sides at the same time, they're still not going to be aware of the stimulation on one side, which suggests that they use their control lateral hemisphere to do a task that they uh, could not do in the uh, lesion hemisphere. All right. Other questions? Not, then thank you very much, uh, Michel, again, for this very nice talk and discussion. Uh, we can start directly with uh, Leah's presentation, which is also uh, about uh, why the matter, and which will be played on the, on the screen, because Leah could not be with us today. Hi, I'm Leah Talotti. I'm here to work 